Hi, I'm Prof L and welcome to Chemistry Matters. And in today's video, we are going to be looking at the basics of chemical kinetics. We are going to kick off today by looking at a particular equilibrium, in fact, and that equilibrium is the equilibrium between N2O and nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is the value of its equilibrium constant. Let's have a look at that. K for this, the equilibrium constant is 1.8 times 10 to the power of 36. Okay, so that is one followed by 35, zero. That's, that's a big, 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 big number. And if you've watched the videos on thermodynamics, you'll know that that means that this particular equilibrium lies very, very, very much to the right-hand side. In other words, at equilibrium, we're going to have basically no N2O and pretty much everything as N2 and O2. And so that's telling us that N2O is unstable and it shouldn't exist. But those of you who have broken your arm or something like that and uh, have been to the surgery and have inhaled this stuff called N2O, which is otherwise known as laughing gas, you will know that it most certainly does exist and it does a damn good job. I can attest to that myself, having broken both arms at the one time falling off my bike. Um, so what's the story here? Thermodynamics says that this stuff shouldn't be stable, or in fact it isn't stable, but we know that it exists at room temperature and pressure. So what's going on here? <clears throat> Is thermodynamics lying to us? No, thermodynamics never lies. But the one thing that we haven't uh, taken into account here is this thing called chemical kinetics. Yes, N2O is thermodynamically unstable, but kinetically, it is stable, okay? So in other words, what we're saying is that the kinetics, the speed of the reaction for N2O to give N2 and O2 is really, 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 really slow. Okay, so when we're talking about stability, thermodynamics only tells us half the story. The other half is chemical kinetics, okay? And so that's what we're going to spend this and another couple of videos talking about because it's a very, very important part of chemistry. Right, a little bit of background. Kinetics, the word comes from the Greek word kineo, which means to move, which is very, very appropriate because what is it that we need in order for chemical reactions to occur? If we've got a molecule of A here and a molecule of B here, and we want them to react, what's the one thing that they have to do? They have got to collide, okay? Why do they have to collide? They have to collide in order to get the energy to overcome the energy barrier for them to react, okay? So in other words, what we're talking about with kinetics is a study of collisions between atoms, molecules, ions, or whatever, and that then gets them to react, okay? Why do we study kinetics? It's not just about the speed of reactions, it also tells us a lot about how chemical reactions occur on the molecular scale, right down when we're talking individual atoms and molecules. From a study of chemical kinetics, we can figure out how those actual reactions occur, which is, you know, really, really cool stuff. So, um, if we were to draw a little diagram of energy versus, um, well, we call it the reaction coordinate, but you could equally well call it probably time uh, as the reaction occurs. We start off with our reactants over here and we finish up with our products over here. So let's say our products are of lower energy than our reactants. And um, what then happens is that if this was energetically downhill all the way, then all reactions would occur uh, instantaneously, and we would all be turned instantly into carbon dioxide, because that's <laughs> thermodynamically where we're all going to end up. Um, but that's not what happens. What in fact happens is that all reactions don't occur very, very easily, 
And that is because we have this activation energy here. We've got an energy bump, essentially, or an energy hump, if you want to call it that, that you have to get over in order for reaction to occur. And this energy hump, this energy is called the activation energy EA. And that is uh, absolutely vital in all studies of chemical kinetics. It's all about activation energy. Reactions that have a small activation energy will occur very rapidly. Reactions that have a big activation energy will occur very, very slowly. Okay, so those are the fundamentals. Those are the fundamentals. So we're talking about collisions, and we're talking about collisions that have sufficient energy in order to get over that activation energy barrier and go from reactants to products. Right, so... So far, so straightforward, I think. Um, nothing too frightening there. But kinetics does scare a lot of students, in my experience, because we start talking about the rates of reactions. And uh, that word rate, any of you who know a little bit of mathematics will know that the word rate is kind of inextricably linked to calculus. Okay, so yes, that's true. It is, and yes, kinetics does utilize calculus, but don't turn off because we are going to have uh, a look at calculus. We're going to have a look at rates. We're going to have a look at slopes of graphs because that's all that the calculus is in this. It's all to do with slopes of graphs. So let's go right back to the beginning very, very fundamental uh, maths in this case, in a chemistry video. And let's see what slopes of graphs are all about. Let's do a little bit of revision. I'm sure pretty much all of you watching this will know all about slopes of graphs. Okay. That being said, let's go back to the fundamentals and uh, make sure that we understand uh, exactly what slopes of graphs are all about. Okay. Right. So, here we have a graph, okay? And this just happens to be the graph of a particular function. And that particular function is y is equal to 2x plus 2. Okay, um, now let's plot that graph. So we have here plotted the black circles and you can see straight away that this graph is a straight line. Now that probably shouldn't be too surprising because this particular graph has got the general um, formula y is equal to mx plus c. Okay, and remember m is equal to the slope and c is equal to the y-intercept. Now, again, you all know that, you probably learned that at high school, okay, if not before. Now the important thing here that we are interested in is m, the slope of this graph. Now, importantly, the slope of this particular graph, because the graph is a straight line, the slope is constant. It doesn't change, okay? And how do we determine what the slope is? Well, we take the change in y and divide it by the change in x. Okay, so the slope of any graph, we could say, is delta y upon delta x. Now, some of you will have been taught at school that the slope of a graph is rise over run. <clears throat> we won't go there, okay? Please bear with me. It's delta y, the change in y, over the change in x, okay? Like that. So in order to determine the slope, let's take a couple of points at random. So let's go from x equals 10 and x equals 0 and see what the slope of this particular graph is. And if you do that, uh, at x equals 10, y is equal to 22, and at x equals 0, y is equal to 2. So therefore, delta y upon delta x, in this case, is going to be 22 minus 2 divided by 10 minus 0, and that, obviously, is equal to 2. So the slope of this graph is 2. Right, fundamental, basic stuff. You pretty much, I'm sure, all know that. Now, that's not where <laughs> the problems start. The problems, or the perceived problems, let's say, start when we have got a curve, 
Okay. So let's have a look at this particular graph now. And now we have got a graph of the function y is equal to x squared plus 2. Okay. And straight away we plot this and we see we have a curve on our hands. This is not a straight line anymore. This is a curve. And a little bit of thought hopefully will convince you that if we've got a curve, then the slope of that curve is not constant. Slope of a straight line, yep. S slope of a curve, absolutely not. So the slope of a curve changes at every point on the graph. So how do we deal with this? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to start off using exactly the same method that we use for a straight line. We're going to talk about the slope of this curve as being delta y upon delta x, exactly the same as we did for the straight line. Now, let's start off by um, taking a particular value of delta y and a particular value of delta x. So what we're going to do is we are going to take uh, a value, as I say, delta y divided by delta x, and then we're going to make those delta y's and delta x's smaller and smaller and smaller, and we're going to see what happens. Because that's the way that we're going to determine what the slope of a graph is when your graph is a curve. So we're going to start off with this purple uh, triangle here, essentially, where delta y is going to be this distance, and delta x is going to be this distance here, okay? So let's go, let's start at um, x equals 5. So we want to find out what the slope of this graph is precisely at the point x equals 5, y in that case being 27. Okay? So we're going to start off with x equals 5, y equals 27, and let's say that our delta x now, we're going to go down to x equals 2, and y in that case is going to be 6. Okay, so therefore delta y if we're choosing these particular values of delta y and delta x. So delta y is going to be 27 minus 6, and delta x we're going to say is 5 minus 2. And what does that give us? That gives us 21 divided by 3, and delta y upon delta x there is 7. So we might say that the slope of the graph is 7, using the same method that we use for the straight line. Is that true? No, it's not. As we're going to see, because now what we're going to do is we're going to make delta y and delta x both a little bit smaller. So let's do that. So let's, instead of going from x equals 5 to x equals 2, let's now follow the green triangle here, and let's go from x equals 5 to x equals 3. Okay? So x equals 5 gives y equals 27. x equals 3, so 3 squared is 9 plus 2 is 11. And now our difference in delta x, 5 minus 3, is equal to 2. And so that gives us what? 27 minus 11 uh, gives us 16. Um, and then 5, mi <laughs> 5 minus 2, 5 minus 3, folks. 16 over 2, and that gives us 8. Okay, so now we're going to say that the slope of the graph at that point is equal to 8. But no, it's not, okay? We started off with a big value of delta y and delta x and said that the slope was 7. Now we made it smaller, and now we're saying that the slope is 8 at that point. What's happening here? Again, let's go smaller. Let's then go delta x is going to be 5 and 4, okay? So 27 minus, so 4 squared plus 2 is 18. So that's going to give us 9 divided by 1, and that's going to give us 9. We're seeing a trend here, okay? The smaller we make our values of delta y and delta x, the larger the slope becomes. We've gone from a slope of 7 to a slope of 8 to a slope of 9 as we make delta y and delta x smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, we could keep doing this ad infinitum and get closer and closer and closer to our value of x equals 5, make our values of delta y and delta x smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And if we do that, what we would find is that the slope of that line approaches 10. Okay? And it will keep approaching 10 as we make delta y and delta x smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that is calculus. 
calculus is just delta y divided by delta x as we make delta y and delta x smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And when we do that, instead of using delta, we use d. That's it. That's all it is. We would say dy by dx. And as soon as some students see that, they just quiver because they're thinking, uh oh, this is calculus, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You can do it because this is just the same as finding the slope of a graph using delta y over delta x, where delta y and delta x are, as we call them, infinitesimally small. Okay, that is your revision session on calculus. And you're thinking, why have I just sat through 10 minutes of calculus when this is meant to be a chemistry video? Well, because we are going to be looking at the rate of change of concentrations over time in chemical reactions. Let's say we have a reaction of A going to B. And let's say over here we're going to plot what the concentration of A looks like versus time. We might very well get a plot that looks something like this, a curve, okay? What we are going to do is we are going to define our rate of our reaction as being, we're going to say that the rate of this is equal to minus D concentration of A divided by DT. And again, this looks horribly like calculus, but, well, it is, but it's just the slope of this graph. It's the slope of this graph at any particular time t. Okay, now, the beauty is you don't even have to know how to do this particular calculus. This is just terminology. This is just saying the rate is a slope of a graph, okay? So, we're gonna pick this up in the next video, having defined what we mean, well, almost defined what we mean by the rate of a reaction. We're gonna pick this up in the next video. We're going to talk about the rates of chemical reactions and how they are related to concentrations and times, okay? So that is all important stuff. I bet you can't wait, I can't. So, we will see you in the next video.